Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is John Kitmer. I am the chair of the Council of the Anglo-Hellenic League. You're very welcome uh, to this event uh, being held with Dr. Christos Tsiroyanis, who I will introduce uh, in a moment. You are particularly welcome if this is your first event with the League. I see um, the participant count is rising still, so I will continue just giving a few words of general introduction. Um, if this is your first uh, event with the, the League, you may or ought perhaps to take away something uh, about the nature of our organisation. We're a membership organisation and a charity. Uh, we've been in existence for now nearly uh, 109 years. Um, in a nutshell, we're a friendship charity trying to bring uh, Brits and Greeks together um, in understanding and friendship. We're based in London and generally our events when we hold physical events are in London. Uh, though our last event was in Athens. Um, by the wonders of modern technology, uh, we're able to uh, deliver Zoom events and occasional hybrid events. Uh, so we're now able to reach a global audience and it has been very exciting uh, for us all at the League to uh, make contact with uh, would-be supporters and indeed new members in Greece, and Cyprus and the United States and elsewhere. Let me just unshare this screen at the moment so that you can uh, see us a bit better. Um, let me say, before we get on to tonight's event, let me talk a little bit about uh, the next event. Um, we have two events taking place on the same day. On Monday the 13th of June, we'll hold two events at King's College London on the Strand. At four o'clock in the afternoon, we have our annual general meeting. This is for members only. If you want to go and you're not a member, now is a good time to join us. I will put on the screen at the very end of the session information about how to join us. But our AGM is four o'clock on uh, the 13th of June at King's College London. Uh, I will be sending out to the mailing list very shortly uh, the agenda and the various papers uh, for the meeting. On the same day at seven o'clock, we will hold the Runciman Award Ceremony uh, for the Runciman Award in 2022. This is our flagship uh, event, our most important event of the year. It too will be held at King's College London in the Great Hall. We're hoping for uh, a really good audience um, at the event itself, but those who can't get to London for whatever reason, will be able to watch us um, on either Zoom or YouTube. We have to uh, sort out a few technicalities, um, but there, this will be a hybrid event uh, enabling uh, a global audience as well as an audience in London. Uh, this year at the ceremony, the keynote speaker is going to be Professor Richard Hunter, who has recently retired as the Regis Professor of Greek at the University of Cambridge. Richard is going to talk about those who do not know the sea, Homer and the margins of the Greek world. Uh, Richard is the most fantastic speaker. There will be something there, I am sure, for everyone, experts and non-experts in Homer. Peter Frankopan, Professor Peter Frankopan, who is the current chair of judges of the Runciman Award, will of course be announcing the winner. Um, and talking about the books uh, that uh, formed the long list and the short list of this year's award. And we hope, um, we hope that the winner himself or herself uh, will be present in one way or another at the event. If you haven't been following the Runciman Award this year, please do so. Um, we had great nominations this year and in January, the judges um, settled on 23 books for their long list. The full list is on our various social media sites, on our Facebook and Twitter sites and LinkedIn site. You can also find the information on our website, runcimanaward.org and anglohelenicleague.org. 
In April, a few weeks ago, the judges settled on a short list of eight fantastic books. Um, please um, take a look and um, uh, read along with us. Um, we hope through the award to stimulate reading uh, about books, about Greece and the Hellenic world. And we think this is a fantastic long list and uh, a really interesting short list. So please, uh, if you've got time, uh, if you love books, take an interest in what we're doing uh, and please do uh, join up. I will post uh, information about uh, how to uh, register in person and online for the event. Uh, shortly, keep an eye on our website. If you're on our mailing list, uh, you'll get the information automatically. If you're not on the mailing list yet um, and haven't indicated to us that you want to join it, um, drop us a note. I'll uh, put on the screen at the end of the session uh, the email that you need to contact us to, to get us on the to get yourselves on the list. So that's our next uh, and next event and indeed our last event before the summer holidays. So we are really hoping for a good uh, audience. So on to tonight's business. It's fantastic to be able to introduce Dr. Christos Tiroyanis. Christos is a forensic archaeologist. Um, specialising in the research of international networks that traffic in antiquities. Um, Christos holds a BA in Archaeology and Art History from the University of Athens and a PhD from the University of Cambridge, um, for which uh, his researches were on the trafficking of antiquities. Prior to his doctoral studies, Christos worked as an archaeologist in Greece and as a volunteer archaeologist with the Greek Police Art Squad. After completion of his doctorate, he held a postdoc on the ERC-funded project Trafficking Culture at the University of Glasgow, and then became a senior field archaeologist at the University of Cambridge Archaeology Unit. He's now an associate professor and senior research fellow at the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies in Denmark. He teaches, as you will hear shortly, not only students, but also museum and law enforcement professionals in several countries. He's published in many journals and was a contributing editor to the 2019 book, Trafficking Culture, New Directions in Researching the Global Markets in Illicit Antiquities. This is a really important and interesting and not too well known subject. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Christos uh, here with us tonight. Um, he's going to talk to us about, and I quote, stolen antiquities, investigating known unknowns in the international market. Christos, thank you for agreeing to talk to us. The floor is yours. I'll give you a little moment to unmute yourself and to uh, put up your slides. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, John. Thank you all. Uh, it's an honor to be invited by the big. Um, yes, I will share the screen now. And um, I want to say that um, I have 35 slides aiming to uh, about 35 minutes, really. Um, there will be a short uh, overview, historical overview, very recent one of events, uh, just as, as an introduction. And then uh, I will present four cases, selected cases, um, each one uh, from uh, representing a different sector in the antiquities market and its clients. So one for a dealer, one for an auction house, uh, one for a museum and one for a collector. All um uh, are cases that uh, i was involved in and all of them uh post nine post 2017 exactly to show you that um, uh, unfortunately uh, this um uh, this problem this huge worldwide problem is ongoing despite the knowledge that we have uh, accumulated uh, especially during uh, the last quarter of a century really the last 25 years so to start with, I would like to, first of all, I'll put the marker, just a big laser pointer here. And in 1994, uh, the Italian authorities, uh, during a raid, they discovered uh, what you see here, uh, a handwritten note um, in an apartment in the center of Rome, a note that um, 
uh, presents uh, the Italian branch of the International List Antiquities Network, headed at the time uh, by the American Robert Bob Hecht, uh, with a, uh, a flat in Paris and coming from the USA. But um, he was uh, supplied with antiquities uh, from two different main groups from Italy, one um, uh, headed by Gianfranco Becchina uh, and the other by Giacomo Medici, all of which uh, were directly connected with uh, certain looters, um, middlemen, uh, restorers, and other uh, dealers. Um, and, the, and between them, there was uh, also a section in the organigram, the so-called organigram, um, with collectors uh, and other antiquities dealers. Uh, this is a transcript next to it of uh, what you see here, made by Dr. Neil Brody, um, and based on, uh, uh, on the work also of the journalist Susan Mazur um, in the United States. Um, that you can see more clearly what was really happening. There are even uh, the, uh, not only the names of the looters, but also the, the areas where they were uh, operating, uh, each one of them in Italy. Based on, on this discovery, uh, a team was formed in Italy, headed by uh, the public prosecutor Paolo Giorgio Ferri, uh, who unfortunately died um, almost two years ago in Rome from heart attack, not Corona. Um, a team that uh, included politicians like uh, Mr. Rotelli, who was at the time uh, the uh, Minister of uh, Culture in Italy, uh, the head of the Carabinieri Art School, Roberto Conforti, um, uh, archaeologists like Mauricio Pellegrini and Daniela Riccio, who became the uh, pioneers in forensic archaeology in what has to do with research on illicit antiquities and trafficking networks. Um, uh, Mauricio Fiorilli, who is a, a lawyer and represented Italy in every negotiation with museums and private collectors. And also journalists like Fabio Isman that you can see here that uh, presented the cases that were ongoing at the time to a wider audience. This team, um, uh, most of these members uh, in the team, they um, uh, made uh, certain raids in Geneva, Basel, and Paris. In Geneva against Giacomo Medici, and you see a view of the uh, one side of one only uh, room in a warehouse in the free port of Geneva, uh, with all sorts of antiquities from statues, marble and bronze ones, with uh, Attic and Corinthian, uh, and uh, South Italian and um, uh, Etruscan vases, um, ready to be sold, but others still in cardboard boxes, fragmented, covered with soil still before they were sent for restoration. But also, the most valuable discovery was the Medici archive, 4,000 images, most of them Polaroids, and 35,000 documents, um, including bank extras, handwritten notes, official letters to museums, to private collectors, back and forth, and so on. Um, the same uh, uh, similar raid was, uh, uh, took place in uh, between 2000 and 2002 in three different circumstances against Gianfranco Becchina, that also saw in the, his name in the organigram. And uh, apart from uh, more than five and a half thousand antiquities discovered at his warehouses in Basel, in Switzerland, again, um, again the most uh, the biggest discovery was the discovery of his um, archive, photographic archive, and documents uh, altogether um, totaling to about um, eleven thousand documents. And in 2001, eventually, uh, the flat of Robert uh, Hecht, the American dealer who was heading the uh, International List Antiquities Network for decades, uh, was raided in Paris. Uh, Robert Hecht was um, well known for the sale of the most well known illicit antiquity, the uh, so called Sarpedon, from the decoration of that vase, uh, the Ephronius crater, um, painted by the most celebrated. Vice painter in antiquity, Ephronius. Uh, after it has been restored, this vase from fragments and supplied to Hecht um, uh, from Luther's and Giacomo Medici. 
um, and has been restored by a Zurich um, based uh, restorer, excellent restorer, uh, as a professional, Fritz Burki, that you see here. Uh, later, um, he sold for a record price uh, of $1 million, the first single antiquity that reached that uh, high in 1972 to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, he was posing next to uh, his prize. Uh, armed with all this evidence confiscated from these dealers who were subsequently, uh, most of them, not all, uh, convicted, uh, Dr. Daniela Riccio, as you see here, and Mr. Mauricio Pellegrini, the pioneer archaeologist in the East Antiquities uh, research, um, archaeologists um, working uh, initially and until they retired and recently uh, at the Villa Giulia Museum, the National Tuscan Museum uh, in Rome, uh, here uh, depicted uh, at the gardens of the Getty Museum with uh, a, a camera uh, ready to record the uh, antiquities collection at the time uh, that was on exhibition um, in order to start matching objects depicted in the confiscated archives um, and therefore enable the Italian state to uh, make claims and embark in negotiations with uh, the Getty Museum and other museums and private collectors around the world. But the Italians were missing the main archive uh, the archive of Robin Symes and Christos Michaelidis, the British dealer that you see here and his partner, Greek partner, um, who uh, substituted um, Robert Hecht as the heads of this uh, illicit antiquities, international illicit antiquities trafficking network. And eventually the, the Greek police art squad, and I was uh, very lucky to be at the time um, an archaeologist, uh, uh, volunteering there. Uh, we raided the summer house uh, where uh, Simon and Michaelidis used to spend their summer vacation in uh, Skinusa Island in the Cyclades in Greece. And uh, there we discovered the so called Simon and Michaelidis photograph archive with uh, more than 2,200, uh, mostly almost exclusively uh, professional images. Um, but uh, we were able then to uh, make associations with uh, the confiscated archives from Giacomo Medici and Giafranco Bechina, improving that they were, uh, at least um, in regard to uh, uh, classical antiquities, they were supplied by Medici and Bechina. Uh, this uh, was made possible uh, with the formation this time of the Greek team, headed by the public prosecutor Ioannis Diotis, who was already world famous because uh, he was the one who uh, headed the, also before that the operations against the most uh, long-lived terrorist groups in Europe and probably in the world at the time, the 17th of November, and year um, And then the file of the antiquities networks from Greece and internationally uh, was given to him, and he invited me to uh, be transferred from the Ministry of Culture to the prosecutor's office, his office, in order to handle cases of uh, the archives, identifications and negotiations uh, with museums and so on. And um, this was made possible because uh, we met with the Italian authorities, with the Italian team, we exchanged digital copies of the uh, archives each one had found and confiscated, and the cooperation started, you can see here, uh, Ferry and Diotis under the same, same umbrella, um, literally and laboratory, but also uh, the archaeologists involved, Pellegrini, Riccio, and myself, um, here 16 years earlier and 16 kilos probably lighter, um, embarked into a cooperation that was uh, proved very fruitful for both countries with repatriations for both countries. Um, the story, the history of the story of uh, the uh, raids, research, discoveries, and uh, the first uh, wave of uh, uh, claims and successful repatriations from the biggest museums and private collectors, auction houses, and dealer galleries around the world um, was uh, first presented in the Medici Conspiracy book by Peter Watson and Cecilia Tobicini uh, in 2006. And then the next year, the following year, in 2007, 
um, uh, an updated version of here, this one, to include an extra chapter of the Greek case and involvement by the journalist Nicolas Zivganos. Um, and here are some examples of the repatriations that took place uh, since uh, 2006, um, including uh, some of the most famous museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, university museums also, like the Princeton University Museum of Art, uh, galleries like the Royal Athena Galleries, um, uh, auction houses like uh, Christie's, Sotheby's, Bonham's, um, and uh, private collections like the Selby White Leon Levy Collection or the Steinkart Collection in Manhattan. Um, the first case I would like to, to present to you is uh, related to, to the dealer uh, Jerome Eisenberg, who, as we saw uh, before, uh, he was already known for his involvement in list antiquities from this network. He has already repatriated objects, but also he was known even before that, much earlier, um, because um, objects, uh, antiquities that were stolen from the biggest museum theft in, that, in Greece that ever appeared uh, in Greece, that was the Corinth Museum in summer in July 1990. Um, some of the stolen vases appeared in his gallery, but also um, some of uh, uh, bronze figurines that were legally excavated by archaeologists in Italy, by the superintendents and kept in uh, warehouses of these excavations in Italy were subsequently stolen uh, only to uh, uh, surface at his gallery in, in Manhattan in New York, um, later uh, identified as such and repatriated. Um, so uh, he was already known as a dealer uh, involved in several cases of illicit antiquities from the ground, but also stolen from uh, uh, archaeological sites and recorded therefore previously. So it was an obvious place for me to, to look. And um, in January 2017, um, usually in, uh, some evenings are dedicated uh, my, for my free time to uh, uh, check uh, websites of uh, auction houses, dealers, galleries, and museum collections. And um, therefore, uh, one evening in early January 2017, I uh, saw this object, a, a fragment from a second century uh, Roman sarcophagus uh, that was uh, very familiar uh, to me. And uh, I also noticed uh, the provenance here, you can see, ex Swiss art market in April 1991. And then Dr. Age collection, therefore not a full name, and we don't know if it is uh, still a valid uh, real name in Germany, uh, acquired from that gallery in April 2000. And therefore, uh, either the gallery was now acting at the time in 2017 as an agent for this collector who wanted subsequently to uh, sell the object, or it was rebought by the gallery from the collector if we had to um, uh, accept the, the so called provenance given here. However, the interesting part is the, uh, in general terms, presented the beginning of the so-called provenance collecting history, ex Swiss art market in April 1991. And that was interesting, A, because um, I identified the same object in Polaroid and uh, regular print images from the, Bekin, from the archive confiscated uh, from Gianfranco Bechina, uh, convicted uh, now in Greece for at least two cases, and in Italy in the first degree, but then um, subsequently in Italy um, um, was uh, uh, acquitted because the statute of limitations had expired, a usual pattern for uh, antiquities uh, dealers, in least antiquities dealers that they were involved, but legally um, uh, are finding this kind of way to uh, be more safe. Um, I notified the uh, Greek authorities, the um, Interpol, and uh, also the uh, Manhattan DA's office, District Attorney's office in New York, providing them with all the evidence. And within uh, three days, the object was uh, confiscated from inside the Royal Athena Galleries in Manhattan. And also, 
I discovered the um, contract for the sale of this object between uh, Jerome Eisenberg and Gianfranco Bettina in April 19, as you can see here, 15th of April 1991, for $95,000 at the time. Um, in 2017, it was on sale for exactly half a million dollars. Uh, so here you can see the fluctuation of the, of the prices, how they raise over the years, what kind of investment is considered to be, and so on. But the most important thing is that is proven that um, uh, was proved that the provenance, the so-called uh, art market that we saw uh, before ex Swiss art market in April 1991 was Gianfranco Bechina, and therefore knowingly uh, Jerome Eisenberg, the owner of Royal Ultimate Galleries, was concealing the fact that uh, Bechina uh, was the actual uh, person behind the general description uh, ex Swiss art market in April 1991. The object was repatriated to Greece who did not acknowledge uh, my uh, work and uh, discovery contribution to the repatriation. Uh, instead, um, uh, images of this object and uh, others were included in um, a traveling exhibition that was housed for by many university museums. Here you see the leaflet uh, from the Badis Islandes Museum in Karlsruhe. Others uh, took place in Heidelberg, as you can see here with the program and so on. And um, in there, I'm translating from, Greece here, uh, from Greek here, um, the exhibition is dedicated to the good European practices of cooperation against uh, illicit trafficking. And therefore, um, it's a complete lie. There weren't any good uh, European practices of cooperation. Um, it was my discovery, uh, identification, gathering of the evidence, and notifying directly the American authorities uh, the DA's office in Marfata, New York. Let's see a, a case from uh, a, a museum. Um, immediately after the signing of the agreement between the Italian authorities and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2006, and here you see the image at the time of the um, signature uh, signing of the agreement by the then director of the Metropolitan Museum, Philippe de Montebello, um, where it was agreed to uh, be 10, 20 uh, antiquities identified from the confiscated images from the archives of these dealers, uh, Bekina, Medici, and the others. Uh, and as a 21st uh, object repatriated to Italy was agreed eventually the Ephronios crater 34 years uh, uh, after its acquisition by the Metropolitan Museum. And in 2008, soon afterwards, the Association of Art Museum uh, Directors in the United States, they um, renewed and they visited and renewed, um, updated their uh, guidelines, uh, uh, especially for acquisitions and um, also repatriations. And therefore, they said that uh, uh, in the event here in yellow, uh, that the third party, i.e. researcher, brings uh, to the attention of a member museum information supporting the party's claim to the work, the museum should respond promptly and responsibly and take whatever steps are necessary to address this claim, included if warranted returning the work as it has done in the past, in the recent past, in the case uh, of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But since 2007, I have seen these images, both Polaroid and uh, regular print of a crater, uh, attributed to a very well-known uh, painter, Greek painter in uh, South Italy of the fourth century uh, BC, Python, um, with an excellent declaration of uh, uh, Dionysus and Menard that plays the flute um, uh, on, a, on a cart uh, that is uh, driven by a Papocinos. Um, uh, Images that were included in the archive confiscated from Giacomo Medici, that you see here. And then I identified the same object as lot 196 at the Southbridge New York auction in June 23, 1989. And it is interesting to see that at the time, um, there is every kind of information, including a detailed description um, uh, and attribution to Python, as you see here, 
um, and um, an estimate uh, of what kind of price and what level of the price will be, uh, but uh, anything except provenance. Um, the only kind of provenance which would be even then totally unacceptable was other properties and nothing else. In reality, most probably was consigned by Giacomo Medici himself. And subsequently, the object was sold for $90,000 and acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and entered uh, its permanent collection and exhibition of objects, um, only to be identified by myself in 2007. And I was waiting that the Italian authorities will claim it as part of the first wave of repatriations. However, until 2014, um, the object remained there when I decided to and you see that the, in the website of uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, again, there is all kinds of information except the provenance. Um, only a credit line, the Bothmer Purchase found in 1989, which provided the money to be acquired by the um, sale in, at Sotheby's at the same year. Uh, so I was surprised that by 2014, early February 2014, the object was still there, not claimed by the Italian authorities, probably not identified yet. Um, so I emailed the Metropolitan Museum of Art asking for more information from the file of the object. Um, the Met, probably knowing what kind of research I'm conducting, um, uh, they never replied to me. I was waiting, nevertheless, until May of uh, the same year, 2014. And then I published the case and the identification at the Journal of Art Crime. Uh, and uh, later in 2016, in an UNESCO conference at the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris, I notified the Italian authorities, um, Italian Carabinero uh, in Interpol, but also another in, uh, uh, based in the United Nations. The Italian Carabinero in Interpol uh, in um, early March 2016 that I notified him never replied to. Me. Um, instead, his colleague in the United Nations uh, very kindly replied to me that he had forwarded these and other cases uh, that together with this I notified them of Italian interest. Um, and he had forwarded this case to the headquarters of the Italian Carabinero Art Squad in Rome, from whom I've never heard. And uh, waiting an extra year until May 2017, I sent this case uh, to again to the district attorney's office in New York because they are the responsible authority since the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And uh, they confiscated the object three weeks later from inside the Met, the permanent uh, collection of antiquities. And it was announced uh, the confiscation and the forthcoming repatriation to Italy. Uh, at the New York Times, and actually it was front page, as you can see here, um, elaborating more in, uh, in our pages. Uh, what is interesting is that the Sotheby's reaction uh, when they were asked by the New York Times was that a Sotheby's spokesperson told the paper it could not identify the consignor because of client confidentiality. So they couldn't say that it was Medici, probably, uh, because still they were uh, playing the card of confidentiality, even if it, the object was proved to be totally illicit. And said the auction house was not aware of any provenance issues at the time it handled the sale, although, of course, we saw that there were major provenance issues since there was absolutely no provenance at the time. Furthermore, it's interesting to see the reaction of the museum when they were asked by the New York Times. Um, this is the, the issue, by the way, this is the issue of the 31st of July, 2017. So the reaction was the museum was, had worked diligently to ensure a just resolution of this matter, Kenneth Wine, a museum spokesman said in a statement. Officials said the museum had noticed Dr. Chiroyanis' published research in 2014, which I found out for the first time from the press. And indeed, had been troubled by the reappearance of Giacomo Medici's name in connection with the artifact. But they didn't say that they haven't ever replied to my email. They said they reached out informally to the Italian authorities, but received no response. The museum said that in December 2016, it sent the Italian Cultural Ministry a formal request to resolve the case, for which I had no uh, knowledge at all from either side. 
The Met said it was awaiting guidance from the Italians when Manhattan prosecutors alerted it in June to their own concerns. Eventually, the object was repatriated the same year at the end of 2017 to Italy and was exhibited among other antiquities uh, at the United Nations headquarters in New York in January 2020, here in the image of it, um, with the panel next to it, um, not again referring to my work at all, but uh, presented it as the work solely of the Carabinieri Art Squad in Italy. Um, therefore, this lack of uh, credit appears not only in uh, Greece, uh, my own country, uh, but also uh, by the Italians, who are doing the same to their own Italian archaeologists, Mauricio Pellegrini and Daniel Ariccio, continuing. Uh, let's see briefly a case, another case this time uh, involving an auction house. Um, the same year, in June 2017, the forthcoming auction of uh, antiquities auction of Sotheby's in London, uh, lot number nine was uh, this um, upper part of a funerary Greek attic stell. Um, the same one that I identified again from the uh, Bekin archive, here still covered with soil, just mounted on a base. Uh, when I uh, notified uh, the Greek and uh, um, British authorities, as well as Interpol, um, Sotheby's issued a statement uh, in writing uh, referring to me by name and saying that uh, my research is not correct. This antiquity, they have, they have a, a, an old provenance about this since the 1960s. And the fact that the object is mounted shows that uh, uh, the old provenance is correct. And what was the, the old provenance was John Hewitt, a known dealer in Bog Farm in Kent, from 1960s, they were saying. Then a document apparently, since they are referring to an exact date of the 3rd of November, 1980, in New York art market in general, we do not have any specific information who were exactly so on in New York. American private collection, the story continues in general terms again. American family trust, exactly the same way and so on, and acquired by the present owner who remains anonymous, of course, at the above sale uh, before it was appearing for sale in its office in 2017. <clears throat> However, um, Polaroid images uh, showing the, the same object being treated like that, so uh, at the back of a cement wall, uh, down on the floor before being mounted, covered with uh, uh, wooden pieces and slabs and so on, on the relief area, so definitely uh, not a way of treating an antiquity, and therefore um, strongly indicating that this object was indeed in the hands of traffickers. And furthermore, documents that I found in the Bekin archive dating the object back in the mid uh, late 70s, even, and therefore disproving uh, the collecting history, the so called provenance that Sotheby's were giving. I haven't heard for more than a year what happened with this case, if it was even claimed by the Greek state, if the British authorities art squad in New Scotland Yard have acted and so on, no one was informing me until um, uh, the whole page, number three page in the Times uh, on the 8th of uh, May 2018 appeared on my research. Unfortunately, they are depicting as usually they are doing, not only the British press, but internationally, usually they, they are adding an image of Indiana Jones, who was a looter in reality, portrayed as an academic professor. We have many of them still cooperating directly or indirectly with the East Antiquities Network and looking the other way when they are dealing with antiquities with no provenance and probably looted until they prove to be so. Um, and the journalist back then, <clears throat> the British journalist, referred to this case, and I found out that eventually, and here is the, uh, the area that referred to the case of the Stella, that Sotheby's was announcing that um, are repatriating the object back to Greece as a goodwill gesture, and not, of course, because of the um, uh, loads of evidence that have been accumulated until then for the case. Uh, eventually, on 8th of September 2010, and this is the in Greek, the official 
press release by the Greek Ministry of Culture announced the repatriation of the looted stele to Greece. Uh, it is now housed at the Epigraphical Museum uh, of uh, Athens, at the center of Athens. And of course, again, they never referred the Greek Ministry of Culture to my uh, work on uh, uh, the discovery, identification, and repatriation of the object. Finally, one of the most recent cases is uh, this of the private collection of Michael and Judy Steinhardt, a case that uh, started with an identification I made, actually two identifications that I made at the same sale in Christie's New York in December 2014. Uh, the most significant of which was uh, this um, very rare prehistoric Sardinian uh, marble uh, female figurine. Uh, depicted broken in several pieces and missing part of the head uh, in a regular print image discovered uh, in the Giacomo Medici archive. And from that image, I identified it uh, absolutely restored, has never been broken before, uh, with no parts of the head missing uh, at the Christie's uh, uh, sale in December 2014 being consigned by the uh, Michael and Judy Steinhardt collection for sale, um, estimated uh, at uh, 800,000 to $1.2 million at the time. Um, I notified the Southern District uh, Attorney's Office uh, in New York. Um, uh, this and four more antiquities at the same sale that I identified from uh, uh, Medici, Bettina, and Science archives were another archives as well. Uh, they were withdrawn from the auction, but I've never had an update if any of them uh, were ever uh, seized or claimed or repatriated uh, to Italy or another country. And eventually, in 2018, in January, uh, the Italian authorities raided uh, the flat of uh, uh, Michael and Judy Steinhardt in Manhattan, uh, armed with the image, uh, this image, uh, the Giacomo Medici image of this uh, Sardinian idol, that um, immediately since 2014 identification, uh, I have published and uh, have appeared in various websites and was in the internet. And um, during the raid in January 2018, uh, they discovered hundreds of antiquities in the Steinhardt collection. And among which was uh, the Sardinian idol that was uh, immediately confiscated and launched a further, much wider investigation into the collection of Judy and Michael Steinhardt. In that collection, I identified um, from 2018 to 2021 um, uh, dozens of antiquities, eventually uh, 32 or 34, if I remember well of my identifications were repatriated to Greece, Italy, um, uh, Iraq, Syria, and other countries, uh, including this uh, rare Sardinian uh, prehistoric uh, statue. Uh, and um, here I will deal with another case from the same confiscation. Eventually 180 objects were uh, seized from Michael Steinhardt this last December. And I will show you the case of the marble uh, archaic uh, torso of uh, Kuros, a male statue, Greek statue. Uh, it was found in the uh, uh, Steinhardt collection in this condition, uh, but I have identified the same object from an image, a regular print image uh, from confiscated from uh, Robert Hecht during his flat uh, raid in 2001 in Paris, so presenting the object upside down on a table. And actually, it was proved that uh, this was taken in the laboratory of Fritz Burki, the same person that, again, for Robert Hecht, had restored from fragments the uh, famous uh, Sarpedon crater by Ephronius, uh, sold to the Met in 1972 for a record price, as we said before. Most interestingly, Although it was uh, enough, this image of the statue uh, to, for its seizure that I provided to the DA's office in Manhattan, New York. Um, during the raid, the American authorities discovered among the archive of Michael Steinhardt, 
these images, these images of the same statue, but more, in a more complete shape, you see that um, they are still appearing the uh, uh, thighs and uh, the legs um, below the knees, the high of the knees, and also parts of the arms that eventually were removed, they were broken, uh, probably in order to make the statue uh, easier to be transported and smuggled out of Greece. It is significant that you can see that it is, these images were taken by the Greek looters uh, just after the discovery of the statue in the field. Uh, you can see freshly excavated uh, soil, probably uh, here, olive trees, so on, on a wooden pallet, still uh, covered with soil and fresh heats, and so on. And this statue was eventually, uh, the images are showing um, beyond any doubt that therefore that Michael Steinhardt, uh, if he didn't knew, at least he must have had uh, extremely strong indications that he was dealing with uh, illicit antiquities here. Um, he bought the object, the statue, for uh, $2,375,000 in, in 2000 from Robert Techt, and it was valued uh, by American archaeologists for the DA's office at $14 million, um, which is a record price for my research uh, on if we're talking about the financial uh, value of these objects. Uh, of course, uh, the object was repatriated back to Greece in early February this year, 2022. What is these, are these uh, evidence and uh, work of identifications enough for the authorities, America nor others, uh, to claim and repatriate the objects? Uh, for me, it's just the first step, a necessary basic first step in order to conduct a much wider research into the way the trafficking networks internationally are operating. And uh, here I'm giving you one example uh, of, a, of a chapter that we published with my brother, a computing scientist, um, uh, first presenting, uh, gathering only the, the 93 cases that uh, are being discussed in the Medici Conspiracy book that I showed you before. And with the information for each case, we ended up with this map showing that some nodes are more central than others because more objects are being back and forth from them. So you can see uh, Robert Heck here, the Getty Museum, um, Selby White and Leon Levy Collection in Manhattan, um, Robin Simes and Christos Michaelidis, and so on. But also my brother wrote an algorithm which um, uh, uh, kind of uh, finds out um, an extra connections between nodes that have not yet until 2016 that we published this uh, uh, research of ours, uh, being verified by certain cases, uh, yet the prediction seems to be true because several have been since then being verified by actual cases. And therefore, we have proven that our, our, our algorithm still works and works fine. And also, the, the major uh, um, discovery was that the antiquities trafficking today, or at least until 2016, in only um, from the gathering of information uh, related to only these 93 cases, um, is uh, actually the trafficking is much more complicated. Um, than what we thought it was back in the 1960s and 1970s from the limited cases that they reached uh, back then, because uh, not such successful raids and discovery of archives and confiscation of archives, uh, like the ones I referred to, um, were available back then. And now we have a wealth of information um, and a wealth of new knowledge that have been accumulated uh, for the last 25 years, published widely, more cases are being discovered and given to the press uh, through academic um, work uh, that is being published and so on. And therefore, the public is more involved, is more informed, and therefore, uh, the bar, both ethically and professionally, has uh, uh, far more raised higher up 
for all those who are being involved, dealers, auction houses, museums, private collectors, and so on. Uh, finally, a word uh, of how we can go forward. One way is um, um, what I'm doing here and I'm concluding here at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Aarhus University in Denmark, where I have a fellowship for three years, is ending on the 30th of September this year, where I developed a new method of identifying problematic antiquities without the use of images from the confiscated archives. Because that was my concern all these years, being in a privileged um, position of having access, being given access by the authorities to these archives um, and conducting this kind of research. How could I help my colleagues all around the world and new archaeologists, young archaeologists who would like to join uh, their efforts with us and therefore to uh, produce original work in this new, newly uh, emerging field within archaeology, within the sub uh, discipline of forensic archaeology that has to do with antiquities trafficking without though having access to these confiscated archives, to these images. And therefore I developed a new method that traces the uh, provenance and the connections for each object uh, far back in time based only on the information that have been published by the market itself and chose not to include deliberately and to omit it therefore in various cases. One case is uh, this uh, funerary red figure, 5th century BC Greek Lekythos, that um, uh, I identified in Christie's in uh, 2015. Um, that this was the provenance that accompanied the object back then. A formerly private collection in Japan, they proved that the private collection in Japan, the anonymous collection, has been described as such there. Um, was nothing else by a known Japanese trafficker uh, of antiquities and convicted one uh, from whom hundreds of uh, antiquities were um, confiscated in 2008 by uh, the Italian authorities, where else? In Switzerland. And also I proved that the consignors of the, this object also omitted as information, although it belongs totally at the provenance section, um, were the Abutan brothers, Lebanese origin uh, dealers, uh, involved in numerous cases of illicit but also of fakes. Um, and uh, I proved that uh, through an image that I took another evening, uh, eight months before the Christie's auction in 2015, uh, from their website uh, of their gallery, Phoenix Ancient. So, this is a, 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 the way forward, just one of the ways forward. And um, I'd like to conclude with two images of the same person, uh, a known and convicted Italian looter, Luigi Perticarari. Uh, this is a Polaroid image uh, discovered in the archive confiscated from Giacomo Medici, posing with some of the antiquities that looted from Etruscan tombs in Italy. Um, uh, inside here, depicted inside uh, the warehouses of Giacomo Medici, in the free port of Geneva. Um, the same person was arrested, uh, convicted to eight years imprisonment when was released. Uh, New York Times uh, uh, made the story of him and accompanied it with a wonderful, I think, and John thinks it's wonderful, this image, um, for him emerging from an Etruscan tomb that he had looted uh, long ago, narrating his story at New York Times. This is to show that um, Perticararis uh, are everywhere around the world. Um, hence, the, uh, from the supply uh, side of the chain, end of the chain, the problem is uh, continuing. Um, from uh, uh, the demand, you saw that it is, the problem continues, as you saw with the latest case with uh, uh, Michael Steinhardt collection, one of the most prominent or reputable, now in inverted commas, the world, the world. Uh, reputable in regards to Michael Steinfer collection. And therefore, there are a lot to be done in order to fight the problem from both ends. These are my email addresses, uh, the address in uh, Institute of Advanced Studies in Arfus, but also the, my uh, Cambridge alumnus uh, email address that will always be valid. So anyone of you who would like to 
um, ask further questions uh, beyond the time that we have tonight, uh, or um, to have any kind of discussion or help anyone, uh, I will be always available and happy. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I didn't go over time by a lot, and uh, I'm happy to reply to any questions you may have. Crystal, thank you so much. And uh, no, you uh, certainly didn't uh, go over time. That was fantastic. We have, I think, about, um, uh, with your uh, agreement, we have about 15, uh, one five minutes to, to deal with questions. Um, I have a, a long list of questions, which I'm very happy to pose. We have so far a small number of questions from the audience. Please uh, do type your, uh, your questions in. Um, uh, we will try to get to as many as possible, and those that we don't get to will be shared with uh, Crystal subsequently uh, in case there are points that he wants to follow up. Um, but I want to start by saying, um, well, obviously a big thank you. I, I thought that was fascinating. Um, uh, certainly gave me insights into a trade that I knew uh, really nothing about. Actually, I also found it rather moving. I hadn't expected to, to see a, a photographs of a Kouros, a beautiful Kouros, that was actually damaged either deliberately or carelessly uh, in the process of trafficking. That um, shows something of the uh, of the pernicious effect, I think, of, uh, of this trade. It's not just uh, elite institutions uh, trying to get their hands on fantastic stuff. There is also uh, real damage being done to uh, antiquities through this trade. And thank you for showing that. I think that was actually a rather moving and, um, uh, and rather salutary part of, of the talk. Um, I'd, I'd like, if I may, just start with a, a few um, personal questions. There are one or two uh, questions in the audience Q and A. This are also um, personal. Um, so, so two kind of conjoined questions. One for, for you personally. I mean, what is it that drives your interest in this? Um, and secondly, and I, I think this would be the, a reasonable uh, question for almost all of us. How dangerous is this? I mean, is this a, a dangerous business? Are the the people who um, are engaged in these networks um, dangerous people? Have you been threatened? Have you ever felt yourself at danger, you or your colleagues? But, but let's start with the basic one. What, 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 uh, what's the attraction to this area? What's the main driver for you? For me, for, um, I think first of all is uh, the discovery of truth. Because um, as academics, we all seeking the truth in whatever field we are working on. And therefore, naturally, myself as well, I'm seeking the truth in the area that I'm serving. Um, uh, this kind of truth have several dimensions. Uh, is the truth about uh, the, the way the objects were treated, manipulated uh, through trafficking. Uh, the truth that has been concealed in their uh, um, the way that they were uh, bought and sold. Mm -hmm. um, parts of uh, uh, the so-called provenance, which is uh, uh, trafficking uh, dealings uh, between uh, shady people in the underworld and the underground. Um, this kind of truth that I want to, in each case, uh, to complete and to discovery and um, uh, fill in the missing links in the history of these objects. Mm -hmm. uh, that eventually, when we are ending up uh, with um, uh, a chain of certain links uh, that makes sense one after the other, then we have a complete story that changes uh, uh, widely our, uh, our uh, understanding both about the history of that object, but also the way that uh, the history of that object contributes contributes to our understanding of the ancient world, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, a further uh, aim of uh, my research. Um, and therefore, um, I'm aiming to correct the record by discovering all these different truths within related to uh, each object. Um, uh, the second uh, reason that I'm doing this is that uh, because I feel a responsibility towards our ancestors. And when I say uh, as a, our, our ancestors, it's not 
me being uh, a Greek and a Greek archaeology, but archaeologist, but I'm referring to our common ancestors, mm -hmm. um, our ancestors uh, who are being treated um, in that way. Their uh, human remains, skeletal remains, are being crushed, thrown out of their uh, tombs. Uh, only for some people, a chain of uh, actors in the international market. Most of them still, unfortunately, considered reputable if we talk about dealers and uh, high-end auction houses, um, uh, are being profiting from uh, uh, the way that they are treat the remains of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is a huge ethical issue here, apart from the object themselves. And of course, uh, finally, the damage that they are done, doing to our history, and therefore the missing links that I'm trying to recover and add. Um, and um, uh, let's say that to, to, to make patches in what we should have known in the first place mm -hmm. uh, by uh, either a legal trade or a properly uh, excavated objects with mm -hmm. a license each time. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, threatened, yes, I've been threatened uh, many times uh, uh, by on the phone uh, while I was in Greece until 2008. Uh, I always connected these threats uh, with subsequent trials that uh, um, I had to be present and testify against an um, organized group of looters because I have uh, testified each time I helped the Greek police arts squad in various uh, investigations and raids as an archaeologist. Um, I had um, 174 cases completed uh, between uh, August 2004 and December 2008 being in Greece, uh, but not in even one case uh, I was able to match uh, each of these threats to a certain case. Mm -hmm. I was always assuming, and that was the utmost I could do, assuming that were related each time with the cases that were coming to the court, mm -hmm. about to appear in the court. And stuff. Um, uh, since then, I didn't have, uh, since I left Greece and I came to Cambridge, where is still my main base, my, my family's base, um, I had uh, only uh, several threats of uh, will be taken uh, legal actions by convicted dealers and uh, people who have been already convicted in this uh, trafficking mm -hmm. network. But not even these, not to even one of these threats have been even materialized, mm -hmm. probably because they know, as I showed you also demonstrated here with this opportunity that I always, based on my research in uh, the proofs that cannot be doubted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Photographic and other proofs. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, Kevin Featherston from the audience, Professor Kevin Featherston of the LSE asks, um, were you ever, have you ever been tempted to give up on your investigations? Never. I found my niece, <laughs> um, uh, I found my niece, uh, uh, archaeologically speaking, um, since um, receiving this call from the Greek Police Arts Code, uh, just the day before the opening ceremony of the Greek Olympic Games in Athens, August 2004. And since then, uh, I regularly uh, catch myself to uh, pleasantly work in the night in a way that I've never seen it, perceived it as being work for me or some duty or some deadline that I have to meet and so on. Uh, it really pleases me. Um, I'm, I'm really very happy that occasionally, like this, in this case now for three years that are ending, I'm being also paid for something that very happily I will, I would have done and I will do in some cases uh, for free mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of uh, cases of unemployment. So no, never, never, despite the threats, the problems, the lack of credit of my work, the fact that I, 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 I am publishing these cases and I am criticizing even the so-called good guys who sometimes are actually in a very bad manner mm -hmm. and, um, gives me the opportunity to inform the people. So no, yeah. never. Thank you for your question. <laughs> your question. So you, you, you mentioned credit and um, uh, professors Loring Danforth and Paul Cartledge both ask, 
why do you think the legal authorities and the museums are so hesitant to acknowledge your work and to give you credit? Why, why aren't they willing to give you credit? What, what, what's going on here? What's at play? Interesting question. And what I think more interesting is the fact that um, in some cases, uh, museums, not the Metropolitan, but belatedly the Metropolitan, even in the case that I showed you, the New York Times referred to my work. But uh, um, it, is, uh, it is interesting that uh, uh, most of the museum, even eventually, um, uh, they are acknowledging my, my research, my contribution, and I get credit from them and not from the authorities, which would have been, one would thought that uh, they should have been the ones that primarily would have given credit, given the fact that um, apart from everything else, I'm always offering these uh, results of my research, identifications, the evidence and so on, always for free to them. And uh, yet they are still acting that way. Mm. Um, I'm publishing against, against them. Um, gradually it became a very interesting uh, part of my research also, how these, as I said before, good guys in inverted commas, they are acting in such a way uh, for people to know the wider audience. One explanation I'm giving is that um, they necessarily uh, need to claim credit, even if it uh, uh, belongs to someone else, uh, to justify their positions, the results. Um, probably they, they cannot um, uh, accept that someone else outside mm -hmm the art squads uh, can do that uh, uh, and has this kind of contribution. And I'm talking mainly also, as I referred to during my presentation, also to the Italian uh, pioneers in this thing, mm -hmm. Mark Green and Daniela Riccio. They are the first who have suffered, uh, who have suffered this kind of behavior from their own uh, uh, Italian uh, yeah. colleagues and uh, policemen and so on. And um, that proves the point that uh, they want to make fiestas, the Greeks as well, to present uh, these discoveries and identifications yeah. Yeah. as their own. It's interesting that whenever I publish these cases and mentioning my contribution step by step and all the evidence, no one ever, either from the Italian or the Greek state, um, mm -hmm. uh, appeared to say the opposite because they know it is true. It's very interesting. I'll come back in a moment to international cooperation because I think this is very, very interesting and area, very interesting area. But coming back to the sort of source of the whole um, networking um, uh, nexus, the, the, the source of the network, Constantina Zanu asks, I, I think, a very good question. She says, um, you mentioned looters. Are these people professional looters who go around in search of lost treasures, digging on purpose? Or are some of them ordinary people who happen to discover objects in their gardens or elsewhere? What are you dealing with at source here? Very good question. Um, mainly we are dealing with organized criminals. Uh, organized in groups, operating uh, in a very professional way, so to speak, um, in the sense that they are very organized in so many ways, uh, digging the night and knowing exactly where to go to dig better than archaeologists, have accumulated knowledge that archaeologists may uh, find out uh, uh, decades later. Um, usually they have a background being agricultural themselves and therefore very well acquainted with the land with the uh, different morphological characteristics on the surface and so on. They can recognize spot, uh, uh, a place of interest uh, to dig and so on. Um, we know the names, uh, many names in many countries. Um, uh, many of them still operate despite their continuous arrest and convictions they have which is very interesting from a sociological, also a psychological point of view in uh, this kind of research. Um, anyway, this area is by itself, uh, by its nature, uh, inter and multidisciplinary. Um, but uh, there are fewer, much fewer the cases, they do exist, but they are much fewer the cases of people who are not part of these organized uh, uh, criminal groups. Um, they um, very honestly, honestly, um, they are digging their garden, as you say, or they're plowing their field and so on, uh, and discover uh, sometimes this kind of objects, antiquities. It is that crucial moment 
of what they will do next that mm -hmm. defines them and transforms them from honest um, workmen and diggers and uh, agriculturers to looters and traffickers, whether that is they decide to notify the authorities, deliver the object, probably mm -hmm. taking a percentage of the value in the, in the market of this object as a reward um, that is uh, uh, in, in issue in many countries according to the state legislations, yeah. not to, 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 to give it to the underground networks uh, of traffickers, middlemen, and so on uh, for a bigger profit, in which case they are being instantly transformed as accomplices in these trafficking criminal operations. Mm -hmm. So even the honest people are, uh, it's crucially what they will do next after uh, they, they bump into it accidentally. Yeah. A, a very good question from Chris Deliso next. Also probing uh, the, the nature of the networks, sources to the networks. Um, the question is, to what extent is there network overlap between art and archaeology smuggling on the one hand and other types of organized crimes like human trafficking and narcotics, as well as terrorism and conflict related groups on the other hand? Wonderful question. Uh, links to many other areas of research, related ones, because yes, there, it is linked to other kinds of crimes. It is uh, very usual to, to find, I have personal experience from the region with the Greek police archbold, uh, to discover antiquities at the back of the cars of private vehicles uh, together with uh, drugs and guns, um, uh, officially associated uh, in, in many cases. Um, uh, trafficking paths that have been used for all kinds of uh, illicit uh, products and material like these antiquities, drugs, guns, uh, human trafficking, uh, human organs, trafficking mm -hmm. of human organs also, apart from prostitution and so on. Uh, they are using the same more or less pathways. It will be interesting for a further research to, if possible, to identify and determine which kind of crime first um, led this, uh, opened these pathways first, tested them, and therefore the other kind of crimes followed by following the same paths being tested by this first kind of crime. Um, it is uh, a kind of uh, ongoing uh, research uh, in this area, uh, but it is uh, yet, uh, yes, uh, always very connected and traditionally hand in hand with. Uh, uh, objects uh, and uh, regarded as uh, um, of historical value or of, of art historical value, mm -hmm. hence the involvement of art historians directly or indirectly uh, with the uh, traffickers. Yeah. Oh, Christy, on your, on your first case study that you showed us, you commented um, adversely or negatively on um, what was being portrayed as good European practice of cooperation. C could you say briefly just a little bit about the international framework within which um, uh, the, the business of tackling illicit um, trafficking takes place? Is the international framework strong enough in terms of law? Is it strong enough in terms of enforcement? Uh, and if not, what would you want to see done next? Thank you. Another wonderful question. Um, many things have been done and uh, uh, local uh, state legislations have been updated uh, recently in several countries. Uh, also, international conventions have been updated uh, since 1970 that we had the major convention of UNESCO in 1970 against the uh, trafficking of antiquities of cultural goods in general, but it was drafted and created having in mind the antiquities trafficking. Um, there are still many things that uh, uh, can and should be done. We can see that because of the way uh, some of these cases are presented uh, have ended up. For example, yes, the objects have been repatriated uh, but none of, none of the people involved have suffered any legal sanctions um, uh, because of their involvement. 
And therefore, it seems that uh, for many of the authorities involved in this uh, tackling in, of the crime, um, is perceived as enough, and it seems that the law uh, of its state allows that, of some states at least allows that, to, to, to receive the objects back, so the objects to be delivered by the person who last is uh, uh, handling it, owns it, etc., um, in order to avoid and success, successfully do so, uh, any uh, legal uh, uh, sanctions. Mm -hmm. We saw that with the case of Michael Steinhardt, um, the only uh, sanction that he suffered was, apart from delivering the objects, um, uh, he was forbidden to acquire any more antiquities from now on for his, the rest of his life. Uh, however, there have been comments from various people to a degree and an extent, to my opinion, correctly, that um, uh, this is not the way that uh, uh, the, the field will change, the trafficking will at least be reduced if uh, people uh, involved in the trafficking operations will not end up eventually literally behind bars. And um, the, the, this kind of crime to be treated exactly like any other crime uh, is treated naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's a, a clear answer. Thank you. Um, there is one uh, interesting question also from your colleague Stavros Katsios, who says, congratulations for the very interesting presentation. As holder of a new UNESCO chair in a Greek university explicitly working on your field, we're already involved in relative UNESCO activities. Your reference to the digital part of your investigations is of particular interest to us. I'm wondering to what extent are these possibilities exhausted? So that's particularly on the digital side of things. Thank you very much for your excellent question. Uh, not at all. Uh, there are so many opportunities on doing so many, so much work on uh, the digital side um, and uh, the contribution of this kind of research to the so-called emerging now new field uh, some years now of digital humanities, as it's called. Um, uh, one way forward is uh, a, a project that I'm uh, setting up now, uh, aiming uh, uh, for an ERC grant, um, using these uh, digital resources uh, uh, in a more uh, even constructive way and cooperative way with museums uh, to unravel the uh, trafficking networks within uh, uh, the European continent uh, as regards to museums this time, we have a pretty good understanding of how these networks uh, have uh, acted uh, in the American continent and uh, North American countries, especially the US. But uh, we have a limited understanding about how the same networks operated and to what extent in the European continent and especially in European famous European state and university and private museums. So one way forward uh, using uh, the digital resources as that is uh, towards that uh, direction, uh, but many others can be uh, discussed uh, also further mm -hmm. with uh, Professor Katschers. Very good, lots of work to come. So two very um, short questions, which I th I'm sure you can deal with quite quickly, and these will be the last two things before we wrap up. A question from Francis Manthos, who's a member of the, the Council of the League, um, uh, which also ties into the question I was going to ask you myself. What advice would you give to somebody who wants to collect antiquities on the small scale and to do so legitimately and licitly and you know, not coming up into to, to the world of uh, people investigating uh, illicit art crime. What, what advice would you give to a small scale buyer? Exactly the same that I would give to the large scale buyer. There is no distinction, there should not be any distinction. Mm -hmm. The crime is the same, whether we are dealing with, they are dealing with uh, small um, financially so-called insignificant objects and so on, duplicates and so on, or in rare, unique, uh, magnificent objects, and therefore financially, uh, the price is uh, much higher. Um, a, uh, do not touch anything that doesn't have a, a properly documented, legal, continuous collecting history. Uh, B, uh, always check with the relevant authorities uh, who hold copies of all these confiscated archives um, from traffickers, 
uh, if these objects appear there. Uh, send a simple email attaching images of the object that you want to buy, or if unfortunately you have bought it already, to the Italian and Greek, mainly the Italian authorities who hold the corpus of these uh, uh, archives confiscated from the convicted traffickers that I showed you and others. Um, and check with them, they ought to give you an answer as quickly as possible um, for free, uh, whether your object you are interested to buy or you have already bought uh, is depicted among there and uh, whether uh, th that depiction is also a proof of, uh, of uh, trafficking of that object or not. Um, the fact that uh, may not be depicted in these archives doesn't mean necessarily that the object may be clean, uh, legal, that is, it just uh, means that uh, there is a high possibility also in the future to be recovered further archives, which will prove that these objects are also illicit as well. Therefore, again, we go back to the uh, value, extreme value of uh, verifying um, and uh, having a, a legal documented provenance of the object you are aiming to mm -hmm. acquire. Fantastic. Thank you. That's very clear. Um, good advice. Um, final question from Jim Cleary, um, who thanks you for, for the talk. It describes it as fascinating and sadly depressing. Um, uh, he says he's read um, Chasing Aphrodite and notes that you mentioned the Medici conspiracy and the connected past. I myself mentioned earlier your book, Trafficking Culture, New Directions in Researching the Global Market in Illicit, in illicit Antiquities, which is a Routledge pub uh, publication. Um, he says, do you recommend any other books or publications? So one or two quick, quick ideas. Anything, anything to add to those? Maybe. Um, um, I, I, I have stood and I'm still standing uh, on the shoulders of the giants. Um, I had the pleasure to, to meet my uh, idols and to, to work with them and publish with most of them. And therefore, the publications of uh, Professor Lord Corinne Renfrew, who initially invited me and offered me the PhD position in Cambridge, uh, to his words, if Greece didn't, doesn't want any more your research, which proved to be the case. Uh, the publications and research of uh, uh, Professor David Gill, currently at Kent University, um, uh, also of, professor, of uh, Dr. Retired now, uh, Christopher Chippendale, and of course, as I referred before uh, during my presentation by name, of Dr. Neil Brody's publications. Um, these are a few uh, of uh, the academic side um, uh, that uh, you should uh, definitely I find their publications online available for free in the Academia Edu page of each one of them, and vastly contributed and set the foundations of the research as is being continued by me now, by Mauricio Pellegrin, Daniela Riccio, and a few, unfortunately, others. We are always welcoming more and more. We need them in this ever-growing new field. So um, you referred um, uh, to, to, to books mainly by journalists like Jason Aphrodite by Nelson Framolino, the American journalist, Los Angeles Times, um, uh, Watson and Todicini, of course, The Medici Conspiracy, uh, and uh, others, uh, Vernon Silver, The Lost Chalice, referring to a cup by Ephronius, also looted from the same Etruscan tomb with the Ephronius Harpedon cutter that I showed you before briefly. And um, all these uh, books by journalists uh, came first um, to the wider audience. And uh, they still um, are the backbone of this research, proved to be not a journalistic research in the sense that uh, usually academics who are still cooperating with the international market um, uh, are trying to say that they are. They proved word by word to be accurate. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, uh, an unfortunate reading and bad that this is uh, goes hand to hand with this kind of research. We are. Uh, we are trying to rectify and, uh, and uh, save whatever we can from a crime already committed. So therefore, um, this research, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, is tragic in a way, uh, but uh, very, very valuable, I think, in, in most of other ways. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Christo. Um, so we're at the end of questions. Um, so the end of uh, our session, I will come in a, a moment just to a few uh, wrapping up uh, notifications, I guess. But um, let me first thank the audience for joining us this evening and for asking really good questions. Um, uh, let me thank you, uh, Christo, for a fantastic presentation and for um, answering half an hour of the, those questions. So uh, so persuasively and um, adding interest to what was already a, a fantastic talk. Uh, I thought that was a, a, a really good uh, hour and a half. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, and the cause that uh, the biggest form for um, the friendship between uh, Greeks and uh, British. I consider myself both and um, also, of course, uh, everyone who has been with us all this time for the, your questions, your comments. And as I gave my email addresses, please do contact me further. I will be very happy to, and I will reply to every single question or comment you may have. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, good luck with this work. It's clearly of uh, huge importance. Um, uh, we wish you every success. We hope to read of your success. And if we read of success and see your name and the name of colleagues, then we'll know that uh, uh, some uh, justice is being done as well as the good work that you're, uh, that you're engaged in. Um, let me just close on behalf of the League um, by repeating my thanks to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, through the registration process, um, those of you who ask us to do so um, uh, will be contacted um, with information about membership of the League or you will be placed on our mailing list. If you answered no to those questions and now as a result of Christos's fantastic talk, you know that you want to be on our mailing list, or want to be uh, shown some of our membership material, please just drop us uh, a line to our email address, info at anglohelenicleague.org. As I said, we're a membership organization. We really do depend on the enthusiasm and active participation uh, of our members. So we're at an end. Uh, thank you, everyone. I wish you all, wherever you may be, whether in Denmark or the UK, Cyprus or Greece or the United States or wherever, a really good evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Bye-bye.